Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I have a very special episode for you today. This is going to be part three of an ongoing series of interviews I'm doing with a contactee by the name of Dolly Safran. And I call this episode Interview with a Fully Conscious Contactee, Part 3, Extraterrestrials I Have Met. Dolly is the subject of my book, Symmetry, and uh, she tells her whole story of her lifelong contacts with not only greys, but a wide variety of ETs, including tall whites, short blue beings, uh, bird-like beings, Ra, or the Anunnaki as well, uh, dog-like beings, cat-like beings, light beings, and more. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Hello, Dolly. How are you doing this morning? Hi, good morning. I'm great. Good. So yeah, this will be our third interview together for my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, We've already done, as you know, two. One, introducing your encounters. And a second one, talking about the photographic evidence, uh, which was actually a really popular episode. One of my top ten. I know you have a lot of other evidence supporting witnesses and medical evidence and so forth. Uh, So today I thought it would be really interesting if we could talk about the different types of ETs, of extraterrestrials. You have had the wonderful privilege and honor to meet and interact with. So I know there's quite a few of them. It's not just greys. There's small AI greys. There's the mid-sized and tall greys, there's tall whites, there's light beings, cat-like beings, dog-like beings, uh, the Anunnaki, and so forth. So I thought we'd just kind of go down the list and talk about some of these really interesting experiences you have had that are that we talked about in our book, Symmetry, A True UFO Adventure. So how does that sound? That sounds great. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I know we did cover you know your experience at age 14 where you saw you know the ai grays and the mama the tall gray that is your main uh, contact but i thought it would be fun just to go over a little bit about what the small ai grays are like we'll cover them first because there's a lot of questions about these guys i think and uh, so these are the short little guys right that don't necessarily have emotions or aren't alive as we would think of it? Correct. Um, they are biologically built. Um, they do support a, a, a bone frame uh, to walk them around, but they don't have the same musculature that we do. They're very short and they're very small, very thin. Uh, they probably weigh soaking wet about 45 to 50 pounds each, um, they are uh, vulnerable to uh, anybody messing with them the wrong way. Uh, I call them living dolls. They are uh, intelligent. Their intelligence is um, able to learn. They assimilate things well. They follow directions, and they can make independent uh decisions while they're completing their tasks. They know how to interact with humans. They have human rapport. They have uh, rapport with every other being in the universe. And uh, yes, they do not really show emotion. Uh, This may be my personal opinion. It's what I've experienced with them. They tend to have an odd, quirky uh, humor about them. I'm not saying a sense of humor. They don't tell jokes, but they do things that make me laugh. Uh, so I call it that. Um, they'll right, look so, at me fun. Okay. So they're they're autonomous, but as well they can be sort of used like avatars. Yes, they can be uh, shut off. Uh, they power down. Uh, their skin is actually the electrical component that runs them. They energize through their skin. They absorb light, and uh, it powers up a type of uh, central. Like we have a heart that's pumping blood, they're um, they have a a core 
not where a heart is, it's a little bit close to the middle of their abdomen, uh, central power place that they use. And right. it generates electricity for them. Uh, At least Treber talked about them being stacked up like cordwood. He saw them yeah. on a craft. So you've, you've seen them basically being stored. In yes. A, right? Yeah. Can yeah. Just, can you describe that? When, when they're turned off, they'll walk into a place where we, where we re store them, I guess is the word you can use for it. And they'll walk up to the, the one in front of them, the last one in front of them, and they'll reach around and then we turn them off. Uh, they power down and they stay like that standing up. Sometimes they'll lean in and they look like they're cordwood stacked up against each other. But yes, I've had one instance where I saw them laying down. Uh, that was just once. And I thought that was weird, but they mostly stand up stored. <laughs> yeah. So, so these are the guys that usually come to pick you up, right? Yes. Yes. Right. So in that regard, you've probably interacted with them hundreds upon well thousands of times thousands and thousands of times yes yeah they're everywhere they are the workers of uh uh et uh they can take gamma radiation uh for longer 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 periods of time they don't have dna per se that'll break down and hurt them and uh they do all the work in deep space um the et like to make it to a planet as quickly as they possibly can. It has a magnetosphere because they're protected that way from huge amounts of gamma radiation. So they spend as little time in actual open space as they can. And so the AIs are the ones that do all that work. All right. So that drawing you did is the, the main type. Is there just one type of these guys? They all look um, the same? Yeah, they pretty much all look the same. It's whatever works, you know, the <laughs> simplest is the best. And th that was it. That's the best they have. Yes. And they're like three feet tall. Is yep, just under three feet. Just uh, almost three feet tall. Oh. I've never. Uh, they've always all the same size. I've never seen any two a different height. So yeah. And do they have names or anything like that, or they're just no, no. They just um, they don't even refer to themselves as I am. Uh, you just look at them and they know you're thinking of that particular one. And you direct your thoughts toward it, and it responds to you. All right. I know in the book, you told one really interesting story where you landed, and the AIs went out, sort of inspected, and one of them, I guess, touched the side of the craft and yes. burned it, himself. It, yeah, he, it burned him all the way up to past his elbow, and it was bad. And uh, two of them ran up to him and helped him, and they walked him in, and uh, he was brought into be assessed to see if he could be repaired. They shut him down right away. They practically carried him in. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't. He wasn't repairable. And uh, that was a hard day for me because you work with somebody or even an autonomous being, you know, AI, and you sort of adopt it <laughs> and it becomes part of your life. And it was one of my more frequent AI that I was around and I mourned for a day for him. You know, it's like, dang, you know. Wow. I, I always wonder what, how much they learn and how much they understand, you know? So it bogged me for a day. All right. So those are the short little AI grays. I, yes. I'm yes. guessing this is what a lot of people do interact with. Yes, absolutely. They're the, first, they're the first line to come in uh, to you. If you're a contactee, you'll see them before anybody else. They're eyes on, hands on, on deck. I mean, they're everywhere and they they do everything so. do they have genetics do you think um no it's mostly just biological organisms that comprise their uh uh their construction and it keeps their skin supple and able to uh, absorb energy and it keeps them mobile and uh their eyes fluid because they do have fluid eyes and uh they can actually drink a type of fluid that helps everything keep going. They don't go to the bathroom or anything. It's sort of, you know, how we evaporate, they evaporate it out. They mm -hmm. don't eat otherwise, and they don't go to the bathroom or anything like that at all. Wow. Okay, I think we've covered them pretty extensively, but most people that I've talked to, I mean, I've talked to people who encounter all different types of beings, and uh, generally people who have extensive contact contact many different types of beings. 
from, you know, mantids and greys and I don't like the term Nordics, human looking, right. um, so forth. But yeah, the greys seem to be, certainly in my own files, the most common. And I know your main contact, which we talked about in first episode, part one, was Mama, who's a tall grey. Right. But I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about, you know, the greys and Mama and, you know, the mid-side greys and the tall greys. Sure. Um, Mama is a tall gray. She has four fingers. Uh, when I was growing up, I have memories of thinking, why do I have five and am I going to lose one of them? <laughs> you know? I also thought I'd lose my pinky toes. And there was a, a thing out in the public where people said we were evolving away from our fifth finger and our pinky toes. And I took that to heart and I was just waiting to be like, Mama, I have only four. Um, it may happen. We, I don't know. It's part of our genome to evolve, we have the same genome as they do. We're human. Uh, all beings have genetics, DNA, including animals and plants. And uh, it is a constant throughout the universe, literally, that we're all uh, human genotypes. We dime out differently, but our genetics are pretty much the same. It's the base of all life, genetics, DNA. And uh, so we're when I say that we are one with them, we are. We are all the same. We all have genetic DNA. We're no different from each other, even though we look a little differently. And we have the same mind. We eat, we breathe, we sleep. We have, uh, we procreate. We go to the bathroom. All of it. We have emotions and feelings. All of it. All right. So, so can you talk a little specifically about Mama herself, like how old she is and your interactions? with her and what she's like? Yes. Um, well, Mama is from the Iran cluster. She is a tall gray. Uh, she is a very, very, uh, she's about 836, 834 years. She's never given me an exact number old. Um, I know that she could live to another couple hundred years. That's what she says. She probably um, shaved off a few years. People like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's possible. <laughs> um, I'm kidding. She, of course. It's okay. <laughs> she is a, um, her job, what she chose to do with her life is she is a, uh, a mother who is, uh, she helps with babies in her lifetime. She's been uh, uh, a nursemaid, mother, that kind of thing. She's helped raise children. She uh, takes care of hybrids uh, like me who are being worked with and watches over us and organizes our days for us. Uh, she handles more than one of me. I know that uh, she said that there are about eight of us that she handles. That's a lot of work for one woman, but she does it. Um, she is a uh, selfless, wonderful, observant, loving individual, beautiful being, beautiful mind. Uh, she is well regarded by everyone who knows her, and she has wisdom that is unbelievably deep and long. And I've learned a lot from her, a lot. Um, You've had lots is, of long conversations with her. And yes. She talks, yes. She's uh, main liaison. She is my main liaison, right? Um, when when I was growing up. You know how humans are. We get in trouble from time to time. We step on our tongue. We do things that aren't quite okay. That kind of thing. And when I made boo-boos or outright, uh, she would just get really quiet and stare at me. And I could hear it in her head. What just happened? You know? And she'd stare me down. And i think, oh, well, now, you know? And she taught me how to do a self-assessment. When I realize that I've walked into the sand pit, so to speak, I look at what I just did, how appropriate was it or inappropriate, whether I was being outside, quote, the, the, the realm of moral morality standards that they observe. And I had to figure out how to readjust myself. What, what, what could I do to fix myself? And she would patiently wait for me to come up with what I thought was wrong how I was going to fix it or make atonement for it, and what was my next step in how I was going to act. And that's how they taught. All ETs teach this way. They're young. 
And I was brought up like that. Um, I was lucky my father was a contactee because he kind of did the same thing. There are a couple things I did that I got in real bad trouble for, but mostly same way. Talk to uh, about some of those incidents in the book. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so uh, she was, um, she made sure that my schedule was right, that I was uh, getting enough rest, enough food. Uh, was I happy or not? She would talk and play with me. She would introduce me to other children my age as I was growing up and give me opportunities to interact with other uh, different peoples that we were coming in contact with. I was given free time where I was allowed to explore through the realm of where I was. ETs are very open to their children and everybody on board, including human adults, and they'll show you anything. They're always got time for everybody. And so if I had a question, it was always openly answered as quickly as possible. I was given free reign that way. Um, it was a pretty glorious experience with her, and it still is. She, like I said, she's, she, she'll answer anything. If I have a question even now, I can contact her mentally, and I'll get an answer from her. So. Well, she, she's a tall gray. How tall do they get? Like, what's the tallest? She's actually six foot two. I understand that she's on the shorter end of it. They get as high as seven five, almost eight feet tall. She's a little bit shorter. Um, it's her genetics to be that way. Uh, the grays are like us. We have tall people in our genome, short people. We all, you know, it just depends on who your parents are. And her parents were a little bit shorter, so she's only six foot two. But, I, I once talked to a guy. He's like, this gray that came into my room was eight feet tall. Yeah. He looked really, really old. Yes, they can get. <laughs> yes. I know. I actually look older than Mama now. That just concerns me, but, you know, oh, uh, she's <laughs> very young looking. Um, I don't know when they start to show their age so far. It's very small amount on her. Uh, someday it might become apparent. Uh, but, yeah, they do get old. They do pass away. They have a lifespan just like we do. And, um, yeah, and right. eight feet is not uncommon. I've seen that. So there's lots of tall grays and there's mid-sized grays and short grays. Are these all right. the same? Or, you know, like here on Earth, we have short people and they're, you know, humans. And we have very tall people and they're humans. <laughs> so these are all basically, I mean, we're all human right. in essence. But right. I guess my question is, are those mid grays and the tall grays and the short grays the same? Or in just kind of dialing out differently in their genetics? You dial out just a little bit differently. The mid grays the mid-size uh the tallest one i've uh, ever seen is about my height five foot eight um they have three fingers instead of four and they use prosthesis on their fingers to help them manipulate things it is their genetics to have that you know in our genome we have people who are born with six fingers it's not uncommon it happens yep. it pops up every now and then well i think that's what's going on between the different grays from where they're at they it was three fingers for those that were there. They're not from the Iran cluster. They're from Zeta Reticuli. They're a little bit different. And then there are even shorter grays than that. I call they're kind of um, troll size. They're between three feet, four feet, four and a half, almost five feet tall. We would have midgets that look like that. You know, we have that genetic component in our DNA as well. And their their skin cast is a little bit more. They're gray, but they're they have more of a blue flavor to it. It's like a lighter shade of blue on them. And you can see the delineation of blue markings on their skin. In other words, we have wrinkles. Their wrinkles are a little bit darker blue than their palette of their skin itself. Just All right. Cat. So my sister in law, Christine Kisara, who's you know the artist for a lot of my books, actually drew an illustration. One of these small blue beings, is that the, what you're talking about? Yes, exactly. I did see that, and she nailed it. She got it. That's what they look like. Um, they work with children. Uh, they love children. Uh, go figure. They <laughs> are <laughs> they're teachers. Um, they are uh, soul teachers. In other words, they're very good at teaching children uh, and even adults. Um, to lose fear. In other words, if you've got a real fear problem, they interact with that. They try to bring joy to people here. They try to understand what it is that you've got going on and how to best repair it. Almost like a little psychologist. They're really good at that. 
and uh, they've worked with human beings as long as anybody knows. So. Yeah, well, it's interesting you say children because I talked to a guy not too long ago. I haven't transcribed his interview, but I can't wait to because he was from Louisiana, and he said he saw these same blue beings coming up to him in his bedroom over and over. So, yeah, yes. <laughs> that fits in with you know the other interviews that I've done with people. And so these are essentially just another form of greys or well, right. humans. Right. Well, humans, I guess. Right. Um, that's what I've been told by other, a lot of contactees. When they talk like, the, like, who are you greys? And they said, well, we are you, you are us. That is the most common message. Well, one of them. Absolutely. Yes. yes. All right. So um, you've interacted with all different types of these greys. And uh, the little blue beings, the mid-sized, the small grays, the tall grays. What about tall whites? Uh, um, what, they, do they look human? Yes, absolutely. Um, they are giants, though. Um, they start shorter growing up. I mean, they're about 15, 20 pounds when they're born. They're pretty big babies. We have this in our genome. They are the giants of old that people talk about. Um, there are a couple uh, ethnicities of them, though, and this is one particular ethnicity as well. And they are tend to be lighter skinned, lighter eye color, lighter hair color. They have red hair as well as white. Um, they uh, grow very quickly. They reach six foot uh, probably by the time they're 16 years old. Uh, the closer they get to 30, they start growing again, and they can hit 7 foot, 8 foot at 30. And then again, they can grow as high as 15 to 18 feet tall. Um, 18? 18 Holy feet smokes. tall. Yeah. You would never see them on this planet. They wouldn't be able to breathe here. They couldn't handle our gravity at all. Uh, when you see them, they're younger, under 30 or thereabouts, and then they leave. Uh, yeah. They're intelligent uh, mathematicians, they're uh, like um, engineers. Uh, they're extreme engineers. They can engineer anything, including computers that we have, stuff like that. Um, they are, uh, they keep a lot of, um, they keep up with all the ETs and what they're doing. In other words, they are, if you've got a strategic issue, in other words, where am I, how am I going to get there, they'll know. Uh, if I have, if I can't find some place that I'm going to go, and I've been told I'm going there, they'll facilitate me being brought there first by another ET to show me where I'm going, and then I come back and go out myself. That kind of thing. They watch everything. They, they just keep abreast of everything. They're also geoengineers. They're, they're mostly on this planet watching what's happening to it, and keeping up with that and giving updates to everybody. So up, appearance wise. Do, do they have hair and like normal eyes and yes, yeah. normal features? As we right. Would think of it? Uh, yep. Uh, mostly blue eyed. They do have blue green eyes and very white. Uh, hair has the hair has no uh, color, no melanin in it. The follicles clear, 100% clear. Right. And people, uh, you know, that I've talked to, I don't have a whole lot of personal accounts. I've certainly read about them, um, but people talk about them being somewhat. I don't want to say non-emotional because they're not, but very sort of, how would I put it, sober, <laughs> serious, uh, intentional. Yeah. I used to laugh about Star Trek because Mr. Spock, even though he doesn't look like them, embodies their mindset. They're so uh, logical and uh, completely scientific in their thinking that they appear not to show emotion or to be very stern. Uh, they have a very rigid way of thinking and... Uh, they don't go outside that at all. In other words, if you throw a curveball at them, uh, your curveball is going to go right by until they assess why it did that and then talk to you about it later. That's how they are. And they're very protective parents of their offspring. And uh, uh, they have uh, serious uh, parameters of where they'll allow you to go with them. They're very much in their own space. Um, do, do you have, I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you think of any specific encounters you've had with them that might be interesting to share? I've transported um, them, and one of their children 
uh, decided to come and see me up on deck and uh, wanted to watch me fly. And it was a little girl and her mother. Uh, there's rules about how you walk around them, okay? And uh, I wasn't on deck when they wanted to bring her up. I had to walk right by them. And I did a detour on my own deck and walked around. the. There's a wall in the back of our, you know, my seat. And I walked around the wall and they came and sat in my chair. And I had my hands open and up on my lap. And she entered first. The mother did. And I said, welcome to you. Welcome to my station. And she said, greetings to you. And she said, I have a child who would like to visit with you and sit with you and watch you fly. Would that be permissible? And I said, yes. And she said, will you observe my child's needs? And I said, yes. And I knew exactly what they meant by that. I don't touch her. Uh, let her speak to me and ask me what she wants to know, that kind of thing. They're very weird that way. Don't want to upset her way of thinking. And I said, okay. So we got on deck and I, she sat in and uh, her mother was in the doorway, slightly out of it, watching us. And uh, she looked at me and she said, can we go for a flight? And I said, yes. And I said, oh. do you have any questions before we go? And it's a long story, but be that as it may, we got out, went out. I allowed her to fly that day, showed her, and she picked it up immediately, amazed the you know what out of me. She was <laughs> entranced and thralled and she acted just like I did first flight I ever took and I'm like I'm thinking oh my god this kid's gonna fly okay I could hear it in her head and her mother sitting at the doorway giving me this face she went <laughs> I was like oh no they don't like this and uh she asked me she said straight to my face if I asked to be a pilot would I be allowed and I hear Talata back there going yes say yes. <laughs> and I said, yes. And her mother was like, okay. And, and I said, you have to um, learn many new things. Are you willing to do that? And she said, yes. And I said, well, that's great. And as she got up to leave, she freaking hugged me, totally broke her own protocol, wrapped her arms around my neck and hugged me tight. And I started crying. I could not help myself. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I, I brought one in, you know, and uh, it freaked, freaked me out. That was incredible. I got touched by a tall gray. Never, ever, ever before or tall after. white. Tall white. Well, yeah, tall white. Excuse me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it freaked me out. I mean, just <laughs> freaked me the heck out. That's that's really special. Yeah. I just want to remind all the people who are watching, listening, that Dolly's main mission is flying, flying this craft. I actually want to do a whole episode on that, Dolly. <laughs> Okay. Um, perhaps that would be the next good episode because that story is very interesting. And Talata is the ship, the the Correct. entity who, well, not the ship, but the entity who embodies the ship. All right, so, oh, that's cool. Now I want to move to some of the other really cool beings that you've seen. And one that really, I mean, we covered this in the book, but I would love to talk a little bit about this, would be the dog-like beings. Um, yes. I'm not sure what they're, you call them. <laughs> they're like Horus, Egyptian, you know, the Egyptian uh, deity Horus. They're yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah there's images cool. of this that we we can see. Yeah, I'll put some up when when you describe them. But uh, yeah, if you could describe yeah. that one encounter you had, which I believe you were on ship and walked right by them. <laughs> yes. Uh, they have, um, uh, you know what a German shepherd looks like, right? A black totally black German shepherd or a black, totally black wolf. Uh, their skin is um, not as hairy. It's very thin, like a, like a really short haired dog. They have hair like that on their skin and uh, they have tall ears and they don't sit on the sides. They sit up and they can rotate them like a German shepherd did for sound. Um, they have a very, a much broader face than a German Shepherd. It's much broader, and their eye set is larger than a German Shepherd. Uh, their eyes are golden, sometimes uh, golden, got green in it, a little bit of green and gold, not brown, green and gold. Right. So uh, you saw all this as you were walking by them? Yes, I am a trained observer, and I, I marked them in my head. Are you kidding? <laughs> I looked at everything. I went up so and down. Yeah, so if you could just describe that whole incident, how it unfolded. 
I was coming back to go to my quarters from something I was doing. And it's a long hallway to my quarters. And just as you enter this hallway, they were standing right there at the opening, two of them. And they were communicating with one another. And uh, one was adjusting something on his arm. And hold on. So I stood there flabbergasted when I first saw them. I didn't know whether I should walk by them. They're quite large. They're six and a half feet tall, each of them. Muscular, powerful. And they have hands like us, but they're clawed, okay? And uh, have incredible claws on their hands. And uh, I'm staring at that and I'm looking them down and I see they have feet that are kind of clawed and they're immensely huge and they have unbelievable Achilles tendons on them. In other words, stood out and uh, their legs aren't as straight as ours. They have hawks. And uh, were they wearing anything? Yes. Uh, they both had a skirt like a like an Egyptian tartan, you know, Egyptian tartan. They were folded over and they had a belt, a wide belt around them. And I couldn't see where the belt lapped or looped or anything like that, but it was on them. Uh, they had a, a type of uh, shirt on, over them. It formed to them, very tight fitting. And they did not have sleeves. It went up their neck like this, you know, like a, you know, ma- uh, men who wear t-shirts that have that you know, and it comes T in the back, and uh, but it wasn't like that. It just form fitted them. So I could they had, see had armbands or something, or yes, they had armbands on, and uh, he had an earring in one ear, one of them, and the oh. other one he had. I'm not sure what it was. It was some sort of a a medallion or something clipped to the side of his ear. Um, they have teeth. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> He just sort of went huh, like that at me when he saw me. And I was like, oh, God, there's canines in there. And they have big noses. And they both huffed me. They went like that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, OK, they know what I smell like now. And I'm thinking, do I keep walking? And they both did this to me. They went like, come by. OK, I could hear it in my head. So I slowly started walking by them. And I I am not afraid to look. But I was looking out the corner of my eye and I was like, <laughs> them as I went by and uh, I realized that their muscles can flex. They were flexing in front of me and uh, I could smell them. <laughs> oh, and, just going to uh, ask that. So, yes, so you were I like smell them. Right, right next to them, would you say? Yes, I got a whiff. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> They're definitely powerfully smelling animals. Okay. Humanoid, but I could smell them. Every ET smells everybody else. It is a, it is a form of communication for them. Uh, new mothers will tell you this. When their babies are born, they have this overpowering need to smell, huff their own child. And they can pick their child out of anybody that, by their own smell. Mama knows. And ETs are like that. Their smell is very, very developed. Um, and uh, they smell each other. So it's a form of greeting, actually. Uh, when they huffed me, I knew that oh, it was okay. They weren't going to attack me or anything. I wasn't expecting that anyway. But when you see that for the first time, you it takes you back their skin color is very very dark well, they are so, um black so the egyptian hieroglyph images are pretty accurate then. accurate very very accurate wow. um they weren't carrying a staff or anything like that but they had sandals on their feet too their feet can't wear shoes like us they had sandals um they were so flexing people, their toes so in the egyptian times clearly must have seen these guys <laughs> absolutely oh, of course they did Absolutely. Um, I've run across them another time. Uh, a few years back, I was doing Georgia CE5s, and um, one of our members uh, is a very nice uh, man, and uh, he he would call me. Well, first thing that happened was I used to remote the meeting sometimes. I was living in Florida. I'd remote view them because I couldn't be there. And uh, one time I remote viewed in, and there there was one standing behind him literally standing behind him his his name is robert and uh i was shocked when i saw it i'm thinking how what you know and uh it turned and looked at me and it nodded like yep you're looking at me and i was shocked and i didn't know robert that well he never spoke to me before that 
And after that, the next meeting that we had when we were all together, I asked to speak to him personally and found out that Robert doesn't talk to anybody in the group, really. He sits outside the group. He doesn't even enjoy the around during the CE5. He's just out there. And when he started talking, my it blew my mind. He sounds like them. I have heard them enunciate, and it's incredibly deep-throated, oh, not a, quite a growl, but, uh, you know. Right. And I suspect Robert, a lot of people are having contact, but when it's really extensive <laughs> and... Uh, they often, I'm going to say usually, don't go public with it. Right, so they don't. Kudos Robert, to you yeah. for you know being willing to discuss all this. I know there are people who are skeptical out there, and uh, there's a lot of people who are having encounters as well. Right. I'm sure this- Nobody should feel weird about it, I, I promise you. It's not, I'm not, I don't get a lot of uh, people uh, who attack me over it or anything like that. It's pretty good. I'm happy about that you know? well you know for the skeptics out there one day they <laughs> they'll find out one way or the other truth takes care Correct. of itself so <laughs> yep so those are the dog-like beings i personally yeah. don't have a whole lot of accounts i have run across it a few times so it's very interesting to hear you talk about it and the connection to the egyptian stuff is just fascinating to me when i heard you starting to describe that i'm like oh my gosh this is seen these before in Im- images that's really cool but one i have heard a few times is cat-like beings yes I've heard people say that they're lyrans i don't know that that's true i talked to a lady by the name of sue described this is my first account where she described a cat-like being that it was maybe three and a half feet tall covered with dark fur little cat ear cat a walking cat and she, could, she couldn't pronounce its whole name, so she called it Marie, M-R-E-E. But she had many, many interactions with this cat-like being. And I understand, you know, I, we talk about this in the book, but you had an encounter with uh, these, this type of cat-like beings. I wonder if you could talk about that encounter and these cat-like guys. Um, I was on a mothership, and again, I was going somewhere I was supposed to be on the ship. And I was walking down a long hallway, and there they were, right there, right in front of the door where I was going to go through. Sometimes I, I, uh, I didn't realize it then, but I realize it now, that uh, they deliberately were waiting to show themselves to me. And uh, they were two cats. Uh, they stand up. Uh, one had a long tail, actually, and the other one had a stubby tail. Um, they were gray in color. Both of them, but had white places on them. Uh, they were short furred, not long furred. And uh, their faces are more angular, you know, like a cat than a human. And But they have the cat face and the nose with the nub nose, you know, the. And when they smile, uh, their lips are just like a cat. In other words, it's the, you know, the, the split and it does that but when they open their mouth you see the four small teeth in the front the big canines the second set of canines on the bottom as well and hardly any molars back there she one of them yawned and i saw the entire inside of her mouth i was like whoa (laughs) Um, were you able to touch them no uh i brushed by one on purpose (laughs) so i could feel uh they feel like um mink they have that kind of fur Minky, very, very uh, moist, not moist, what's the word? Luxurious, like a mink, you know, oil. There's a, a certain amount of oil in their fur, okay? And I think when they groom, they're doing that, or I'm not sure. They you, do groom. I know that because to them at all? did this. Um, yes, I tried to. I said, hello. I said, um, my name is Dolly. And then I and she looked at me funny because she knew Dalgon well. That's not what they call me on board. I'm Aura, okay? And I said, okay, Aura. <laughs> she uh, smiled at me at that point. That's when I got to see the teeth and she yawned. And I said, uh, where are you from? And she, she, she did this. And she said, same galaxy. And I went, okay. 
And uh, she said, Orion, like that. And I went, okay. There are many different planets in the Orion clusters, and I think she's from, they're from one of them. Uh, Is that telepathic? Yes, all telepathic. They do talk and they purr. This is what got me because I could hear her. You can, they can communicate and purr at the same time. You know, it's under their, in their chest area. You can hear it like that. Right. And I'm like, oh my God, she's purring. And uh, I said, beautiful, beautiful, like that to her in my head, letting her know that I thought she was beautiful. And they smiled and they nodded. And I said, I greet you and I must go. And I walked by her and I brushed up on her, used my hand. I felt her. <laughs> I was like, wow. You know? And uh, about how old were you when this happened? 10, 11, somewhere oh, wow. around there. I was a little more spirited at that age, a little bit more handsy, <laughs> you know? And uh, yeah, they were amazing to me. I went straight to mama in my head after that. Who, what, what? You know, and she said, uh, they have been on this planet for a long time. They were worshipped as deities. And she said, they uh, come and go here. They're more interested in us as observers than as uh, interactors. And they like us, which is amazing. And I said, is it like that where you're from? And she said, yes, they're with us. It's like, cool, cool. I've never seen one on planet, though. Where I was going to learn and stuff, I never saw a cat being again. And I'm thinking, where are they? And she said, they're in Orion, you know. So that's all I know about them. That's all I know. They've been here. They interact with us. They like us. Okay. I don't know. We also, I believe, once had an encounter with what we would describe as light beings. Yes. Um, that encounter. Okay. Um. There are corporeal light beings who are uh, interdimensional as well, but they're in the third, you know, the third dimension with us. They sort of go back and forth. They're able to interdimensionally travel on of their own accord, of their own ability. And uh, they appear when they travel, they become full light, you know, and you just see parts of them. Because they're so brilliantly light and they, their auras zoom out, you know, in a certain way. And they kind of look like angels. Um, That's interesting. And, and you, uh, you saw these? Yes, yes. Um, we and were, where was that? Yeah. You know that when an ET crashes, um, we're there within seconds to get them if we can. If it's uh, nobody's around. It's and and we're able to excise them out. We do it, and these light beings assist because they're able to move a ship without uh, us encapsulating it in some sort of energy beam or whatever. They can actually lift the ship up and get it high enough for us to capture it. That way, they get it off the ground pretty quick. If there oh. are beings alive in the craft, they evacuate them. They are able to take them for us. They're part of a rescue. They have rescued humans. I've seen them do all kinds of things on this planet. Yeah. Very cool. All right, gosh. There's a few more I wanted to cover. Um, you once, I mean, you described seeing, I mean, there's hybrids, of course, very human hybrids, but what people call the Nordics or human looking beings. Humans are throughout the universe. Is that correct? Yes. That the the human genome is a constant. Like I said at the beginning, we all have DNA, and it's all pretty much the same type of DNA. It is the same. It just dials up differently. Um, it is infinite, the combinations of DNA that can occur. They're all carbon-based life forms, nitrogen, oxygen, you know, proteins, all of that. Um, we all need light. We all need a third-dimensional uh, place to be fully uh, brought into existence here with the DNA. Uh, some take themselves out of it, like the light beings, they've already walked out of it. But yes, we're all human genotypes. We all stand, we all walk, we all have fingers, we all eat, read, sleep, procreate, go to the bathroom, yep, all of it. We Just jumping back to the greys too. The, do the greys have an odor? Uh, yeah, they're very earthy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they like the temperature to be 
uh, higher than 77 degrees. They go from 77 to 84, 86, 87 every now and then. But that's what they keep the craft at, that they're on. Uh, you, if you don't have hair, you can't evaporate out uh, properly. You know, your hair can't wick to keep you cool. And uh, so they keep it a little bit warmer. That's and, interesting you uh, say earthy have, because Whitley Strieber had a couple of people at his cabin who both had encounters on the same night. Yeah. Lori and Raven, I think were their names. Anyway, they one described as very earthy, very woodsy. And the other yep. said, very woodsy, very earthy. <laughs> so he used the same yeah. exact terminology. Yes. Yeah. Yep, exactly. He says kind of, Whitley said it's almost a cinnamon-like odor. Exactly. He's got it. That's it. Right. I like to say sandalwood, okay? It's somewhere <laughs> between cinnamon and sandalwood, but we all perceive smell a little bit differently than the other. So my take is more cinnamon, sandalwood, but yeah, it's amazing, right. yeah. So going back to the human-like ETs, um, I do want to do a, another episode where we talk about the various planets you've been to, but there was one that was kind of a water-type world with lots of water on it, and you encountered some human-looking beings there and one was a girl by the name of uh mia was it micha 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 yeah i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what she was like micha is a star person um we have people on this planet who are absolutely related to her um all the star people on this planet have some relation to where micha is from it's in the delphi system uh if you look at orion and you go through a line orion and you're flying out, you'll run into the Pleiades. And if you pass the Pleiades, you go straight into those systems where Delphi is and everything. That's how we fly through. Um, the star people here have been taught that they're Pleiadian or from Ple- the Pleiades. It's not exactly that, it's through the Pleiades. That's what they're trying to describe to them. That's on the other side of it. Um, but they're uh, Polynesian looking or Native American looking, Inuit looking, you know, uh slavic looking they all have the chinese they all have the almond shaped eyes the really high ridges in your cheekbones we're all related to that we have that type of bloodline right. um, you said micha had her hair was slightly different or teeth i think yes um micha had more teeth than we do they were <laughs> a little bit more pointed and she had more uh eating meat she she ate fish a lot um she could tear through anything uh, and her hair was much denser and thicker, okay? Real heavy and dark. And she had beautiful, beautiful hazel green eyes, you know, with gold flecks on them. And uh, she was tan, you know, golden colored. And uh, she was absolutely stunningly beautiful. And so sure. was everybody else in her area. Because we have all different types of hair here on this planet. <laughs> and skin colors and body right. types. <laughs> Uh, she's lived there her whole life. She's been brought out and was taught like I was, you know, and learned, but brought back and she prefers to live where she's at on the, in the Delphi system. Uh, there are other beings on this planet as well. But Micha is um, an artist. Micha loves music and she makes things. That is her gift. And uh, she creates things. She's very evolved. And that's All what right. she does. You spoke with her telepathically as well? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that seems to be the general rule with people who are having contact. Telepathy is the universal language. Yes. Awesome, because that removes, you know, lying or miscommunication or. Correct. You can't you can't <laughs> fib to anybody because they hear what you're thinking. Um, um, prevarication it doesn't exist between them at all, and if you even think to do it, you get nailed instantly. It's like hmm. They'll say hmm. But they don't, <laughs> that's why they don't story tell because they don't have it in them to do that. They only tell the truth. So any stories you hear from them are about real life things that have actually happened among them. That's their storytelling. And actually, if you think, if you go back to the time of early humans, that's how we communicated to one another. We told each other what happened. That's how we learned by that type of communication. I'm not sure when people started uh, elaborating or painting new pictures but yeah all right and you also talked a little bit about beings who spend a lot of time in the water and yes they are water beings uh they're on the same planet with micha 
they're humanoid in that they have arms and legs, but they only live in the water. They can come out of the water, but not for long periods of time. They dry out and it's not good or healthy for them. They are uh, lactating human uh, like we are and breathe air. They don't have gills, okay? So when they go under, they can hold their breath for long periods of time, but they always come up. Um, they have a way of existing this way. They eat fish, they hunt fish, and they're super intelligent beings. They have sonar capabilities like dolphins and whales do. They can image you by looking at you underwater. Uh, they are psychic and their language is so complex, it's almost impossible to learn it. So I never really, I listened a few times. They do the sporadic clicking and talking that way. If I was brought up that way, I might have learned it, but. I don't I know if you older. can answer this, but do they like sleep in the water? Or yes, absolutely. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a whale can sleep for two hours straight up and down in the water and they sleep yeah. odds together. They have the ability to lower their metabolism. So do turtles. So does any underwater air breathing creature and they have that ability. Yeah. Do they have like webbed hands then? Yes, they have webbed hands. They have um, extra uh, 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 like an appendage that webs out like this on their wrists. So when they switch the water, they really switch in the water. They have a, a dorsal back there off their spine and where we would you know we have the tail thing going on they have another dorsal back there and they have them down by their ankles and their feet are webbed as well and huge have um you, have, I used to, have you ever seen the movie creature from the black lagoon do, do they look like that <laughs> uh, yeah a little bit but not quite they're grayish white color you know like a dolphin they're more whitish than grayish but yeah they have melanin in their skin and their heads are more, you know, rounded in the back. They have a huge brain, huge. They have more than, you know, we have we have two hemispheres, right? We have an amygdala in the back. They have two amygdala and uh, two other hemispheres in the front. They have four hemispheres. They're big heads. Yeah. Got a couple of more types I want to talk about that I know you've encountered. I do get a lot of um, accounts. I mean, I get like three or four main types. Mostly people talk to me about grays, certainly talk to me about uh, human looking ETs, mm -hmm. the sharp blue beings, uh, many different types of humanoids. But one I do get fairly regularly is uh, the praying mantis type beings um, who are usually described certainly to me as being very tall, anywhere from, you know, six on the shorter end to double that nine feet i'd say is most common but up to 15 feet in a few accounts um gray gray sometimes green or white and usually very very intelligent and often described as watchers or people who yes, don't interact so much yes. just record and watch and super intelligent and i know you had an encounter with one of them uh right here on planet earth I wonder if you could just briefly describe that. Um, I had a kidney transplant in 2016. It was in September. And uh, as I was recuperating, I went to stay on a farm uh, where my donor lived, my kidney donor, were friends, family friends. And uh, they had all gone off to go shopping. And I was sitting in the living room and the front door was open. But the glass, you know, the patio door to the front door was there. It's all glass. And I was talking to somebody on the phone. I think it was you, actually. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking across the field, and there's a, a, a big forest out there. And, and then there's some brush in the front and some down trees and stuff. And I'm staring at it, and I see this stump. And I'm looking at this stump, and I'm thinking, what's moving? Something's moving over there. Now, mind you, I have really good eyesight. I, I can't see. That's why I'm wearing glasses now. I can't see from my hand to my face. But I have 2010 vision and I can see way the heck over there. And I'm staring at it and all of a sudden I realize it's moving. And it's not anything I've ever seen in my life. It wasn't a cow, wasn't a sheep, lamb, nothing. Deer, nope. And I stood up and I walked to the door and I said, I'll call you back. I had a little Motorola flip phone. And uh, I turned on the camera and I'm trying to use my, my you know, 
Zoom, which was almost non-existent on that phone, to see it. And I got it on camera so that I could click, 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 take pictures. And I'm taking pictures of what I'm looking at. And I see it above the stump. I just see something above the stump. And then it stood up. And I went, ah, it was tall. And I was like, what am I looking at? My brain went, you know, what am I looking at? And I'm thinking, oh, my God, oh, my God. And it it nodded at me and it turned and it started to walk away. And I went, uh-uh, and I went running out that door. I'm wearing shorts and a T-shirt. It's cold as what the wind is howling. It's like icing out there. And I chased it down and I could not catch it. And all I got from it was, we're the watchers. I watch over you. And it was gone. It just took off like a bat at a boogie. And I, I was so, I mean, I was like hurting because I just had a transplant. I was trying to limp back to the house. And I sat down and I replayed it in my brain to see what I was looking at. It looked like a mantis, a praying mantis. (laughs) You know, it just didn't have the wings. Okay. It had... The hands, you know, the arms and the hands that went up like this. And it was very, you know, agile with its wrists and its hands. And it did extend somewhat. And it had the longest freaking legs I've ever seen in my life. And I'm not so sure it was exoskeletal, though, like a real praying mantis, okay? It had suppleness to it, like it's actual skin on it. And it was wearing a jumpsuit, a long covered from the neck all the way down to its ankles. So I didn't get perfect body details. So I'm not sure about that. Um, It was cold outside and getting wetter and I'm sure it was protecting itself, but it had the mantis head and the huge, unbelievable mantis eyes and the, and the, and the, the mouth, you know, and it didn't talk or open its mouth. So I don't know about what was in there, but it looked just like a praying mantis to me. And, uh, I have chummed that one over in my whole life ever since. Oh, <laughs> another one. Um, yeah, this is one of the thing I f- things I find so fascinating about you know, contactees in general, that they see such a wide variety of beings. Uh, that's not true in every case, but people who have extensive contact and you know, are really gaining an awareness of it and uh, becoming fully conscious, I, I guess, like you've been able to do. Describe all different types of beings. And I suspect this is because you've reached that level of telepathic ability or psychic ability where they, you, know, you can communicate with them. So they reach out to you and they're attracted to you. I don't know. Very interesting to me that- I'm, uh, I'm among them one. quite a bit. So I have more than ample opportunity to view or meet different you know, uh, people, ETs. Um, going to motherships a lot <laughs> afford me that, you know, because they're constantly going back and forth and they move, you know, through on motherships. All uh, right. Well, that brings that, me that's to probably the why. last type of ET I'm, I'd like to talk about, which is kind of my favorite account because it's just, we hear a lot of people talking about Anunnaki and there's a lot of reference to them and ancient writings and such and Egyptian hieroglyphics and these huge very tall winged beings. So you had this really amazing encounter, what we would term the Anunnaki. And this is such a fascinating account. We did a big write up on this in the book. Uh, but I would love if you could just talk a little bit about that encounter because whew, that's an amazing one. Um, first one I ever saw I was very young, probably seven, six or seven. And um, I had been learning about them. Uh, they are prevalent in our history, this recent history. And uh, I had come up on deck of a mothership. I was told to come and find Mama. She was up there. She wanted me up there. Um, I guarantee you that's why she wanted me to meet this being or see it. And uh, there were two standing there they were across the deck. The deck on a mothership is huge. And I walked in the door and I was just amazed at what I saw. Uh, They are very powerfully built, big beings, heavy, okay? On mothership, on all craft, the gravity is not as heavy as it is here. We have lighter gravity on board. Uh, Most of these beings are not used to as heavy gravity as we have here. 
And so he moved about elegantly, freely. He was animated. And uh, he had, his hair was braided and plaited, okay? It was a plait. It's not a regular braid. It's a plait braid. It's like four in one. I've done these braids. And um, he was wearing incredible, uh, he had a wrap around his waist. It wasn't very high. It was very short. I saw his knees. He had boots on his feet, a type of boot, very soft, leathery kind of boot. And uh, his chest was completely bare, except for he had a, a, like a shawl on uh, the front waist. In other words, it went around his neck and it tied around the back of his waist. So he's wearing a shawl in the front. And uh, but his wings were completely exposed and they're they're like this on his back. OK, I mean, one went up this way, one went up that way, one went down that way and the other one went down that way. And I'm staring at it and I'm thinking, is that hair or are they feathers? OK, and I was staring and staring, and staring and he, he looked over at me and he went. You know, like, hey, come on, come on, give it a try. <laughs> I was like, OK, <laughs> I went running up to him and I just staring at his wings and I'm thinking that's either hair or wings and I, I had to touch it. I freaking had to touch it. So I went like this. I pet him. I pet the wing. OK, just like this. The one on this side, you know, this side, this one. And I'm petting it and he shivered and I felt it ruffle and rustle. Have you ever seen an egret ruffle its feathers? That's what it's like. OK, he ruffled those feathers. It's hairy feathers, hairy, hairy feathers. They're densely packed and he ruffled them. And I was like, uh, and I pet him again and he kind of enjoyed it. I think he was letting me pet his feathers <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, my God. And I stood back because I could hear mama stop now. <laughs> so I did. I realized that he had powerful back muscles unbelievably powerful back muscles. He had powerful leg muscles and butt muscles. I noticed that too. And uh, he had earrings. He had five earrings in one ear and one earring in the other one. I could see it from the back. And uh, I was like, holy cow. And um, he spoke the same language as mama. Same language, okay? And I realized that there's something going on with that, okay? Um, and he spoke to me in that language. I understood I was learning it then. So I got most of what he said to me and he let me know that, um, uh, he said child to me, he said like, please child or welcome child, something to that effect. And I was like, I, all I could think to say was honored. I didn't know what the right response was. So I just said honored. Okay. And uh, he turned back around and talked to the other one again. I was dismissed. Okay. And mom was like, go. I was like, okay. So I backed all the way out of there and I got out. That was the most first time I'd ever really touched other than a gray. Okay. And I won't forget that as long as I live. I went through the rest of my life and still do wishing I had wings like that. I was <laughs> but did they have, you know, legs and arms as well? Yes. He had big, powerful legs and beautiful arms and beautiful hands. Um, I have really big hands. I don't know if you can tell or not. See the size of my head. And, <laughs> uh, he had longer fingers than I would have. But yeah, they had giant, beautiful. You have big hands, tall, long hands. Uh, oh, my God. He had beautiful. Hands. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah. um, so um, were, did they have their faces? Were they like beaked? In um, no. Uh, the Anunnaki have faces like us. They're human looking. Okay. Now there are beings that are like raw that are bird like. Okay. The Anunnaki are not birds. They're depicted as birds sometimes. But I think there's a confusion back then of who was who and what was what. The Anunnaki are uh, uh, look Sumerian to me. Oh, okay. I was confused about this. So uh, yeah. they have human looking faces, but there yes. are bird like beings as well. Are yes. they? Are they winged? Is yes. Also? Yes. Yeah. Not like the Anunnaki. It's a different type. It's more like a. Um, they have actual wings. And I'm trying to think of what you could equate it to. Uh, more like a huge. They're more feathery than hairy winged. OK, and they only have two and they do go like this. But yeah, they're winged and they have 
you know, our wings got to have the bottom part, and it just comes straight down. Because right, the in the Egyptian hieroglyphs, I think I'll have to look look at them, but I believe a lot of the what are termed Anunnaki are certainly referred to as they're Ra. Show. Yeah, there's two types. There's the Anunnaki, and then there's the Ra. And uh, they have a name, but I'm not allowed to tell you. It's just they're Ra. And they're very, very, very intelligent beings, and they look like birds. They're birds. All they're right. Humanoid birds with arms and legs. They eat everything. Yep. And they're, are they related to the what we call Anunnaki? Um, I don't know. If I you think they're from that. near each other in, the, in that part of the galaxy where they're all from. All right, so these are some of the many different types of ETs you have met. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, when we were putting this book together, I, I put a whole chapter on this because I just think it's fascinating stuff. I was originally going to call the book Dolly Among the Stars, <laughs> which I think is quite descriptive. We ended up using that for a chapter, but uh, you men- mentioned the title Symmetry, yeah. uh, which I think really speaks to what we're talking about here today. And that there's symmetry between all the beings right. live in this universe. Right. We have that here. If you think about it, um, we're we're all mostly human here. Okay, we're all human. This particular very specific narrow genotype. Okay, but among us are every other kind of animal that you could possibly imagine, and they respond to us. They hear us. They know. Uh, they're intelligent like we are, and we can communicate with them if we want to. Um, they're here to teach us. We're here on this planet for a very specific reason, and that's why. We're supposed to be figuring things out. Right. And so all these beings, I mean, we here on Earth have some very violent tendencies and are not so spiritually evolved. These are all beings who have moved beyond, you know, our, our primitive thinking and behaviors. Right. We're not the here to take wisdom. over. <laughs> Or anything the like more that. knowledge and wisdom you attain, the more ethically responsible you become. You become very mature. And that level of maturity doesn't include acting out violently. It, you're more capable of uh, commanding your responses to everything. And that's basically what you're supposed to be learning here. It's about how you respond to everything, not what everything is doing to you. All right. Yeah, this is why I wanted to do this episode to let people know that you know these are not aliens as we think of them they are us we are them we are all part of the same life that's spread throughout the universe right. we're not hostile or here to take over or hurt anyone or scare them right. i've written a lot about this and interviewed a lot of people who have had trauma and scary encounters and are somewhat fear-based in their thinking understandably because we're trained that way yeah but i think that's what I really enjoy about your experiences and your you know, take on all this as you've, you know, being fully conscious and aware of what's going on and having so many interactions. I think you've got a very you know, comprehensive and accurate picture of what's out there. As do a number of other people I've talked to, but exactly that I would like. <laughs> yeah. The more conscious you are, the more you realize all of this. Um, I've, uh, and everybody that I experience now throughout this journey of talking about things, I've realized that there are people waking up everywhere all over this planet. And their journey is literally progressing wildly quickly. And they're all hearing hearing the truth and they're repeating it. And it's very happy for me to hear that. You know, I get very excited. Cool. Yeah. Well, we've spoken for about an hour, which is perfect what I was kind of aiming for. I really want to thank you, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to give any closing comments or any, you know, think important information you feel people need to know about the, these different types of beings or anything you want to add that we haven't covered. Yes, um, it, it plays to what we experience here right now. We have division among us on this planet. We have uh, actual uh, thinking where if you're not the same or you're different, there's something going on wrong. And it's just not true. We're all beings from the same place. We all come from source. We're all the same, all of us. And race is, is a lie. We're the same. It doesn't matter what you look like. We are all the same. We are all the same race. 
and uh, ET thinks that love will help you cancel that out. Learning to respect and love one another uh, shows you the right way to see things as they really are. And, and, and that literally is, is that just because of what you look like doesn't preclude you to think differently or be different. That doesn't happen. We're all the same. We think the same. We're all capable of the same thing. If you love one another through it, that's awesome. <laughs> cool. Well, I love that. That's a great ending. Love is the answer. That's what the Betty Andreessen's contact, Quasiga, said. Love is the answer for humankind. Right. All right. Well, thanks, Dolly. That was Welcome. awesome. Really want to again commend you, and uh, very impressed with your courage for coming forth and talking all about this. I hope more people are inspired to do so because I know there's a lot of you out there. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thanks, Dolly. I really appreciate it. You're very it. welcome. It's an honor. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Until next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> all right. That's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. We got to hear about many different types of beings. I love Dolly's story because she does not need hypnosis to recall all this. She's not looking at it through the lens of fear. I've interviewed many hundreds of people and I've shied away from hypnotic regression. Most of the people I've talked to have had you know, fully conscious experiences, but often there is missing time. Um, some people do have s some fear, um, but several also have had fully conscious contact, and Dolly's case is right there at the top of them. It's, again, probably the most extensive case of UFO contact I've ever had the wonderful opportunity to research and investigate. So I really want to thank you all for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this show and learned something about the many ETs that are visiting our planet and our relationship to them. So thanks again for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep at Oh wait, one more thing I did want to mention is that Dolly's experiences are covered again in the book Symmetry, a true UFO adventure. So if you want to learn more about what Dolly's talking about, it's all there in black and white and uh, available on Kindle and print and soon to be on Audible. So yeah, again, thank you for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep having fun. <laughs>